All right, welcome back everyone for more human physiology. This is going to be an extremely short video. Uh, we're gonna start talking about the four different types of tissue and in this video we're going to focus on nervous tissue. The reason this video is going to be very short is because we really just want to introduce nervous tissue because future chapters and future videos are going to focus very much on the nervous system. We don't want to give away too much just yet. So let's go ahead and get into this. So nervous tissue is only really going to contain two different types of cells. So the major focus is going to be on one type of cell, which is called a neuron. When we talk about nervous tissue being excitable and being electrically active, this is the type of cell that we're talking about here. So neurons, as you can see in the picture here, pointed out by the black arrowheads, uh, these are cells that can fire off electrical impulses called action potentials, and this is going to allow for long-distance communication in the body. So we're talking about those input and output signals that we've talked about before. So neurons can be very specialized, and certain types of neurons uh, can be specialized to allow us to perceive things like changes in temperature, uh, light intensity if you're talking about the eyes, sound waves if you're talking about the ears. So not only are neurons capable of mediating input and output signals, but they're capable of acting as sensors as well. So a lot of the temperature homeostasis stuff that we talked about in chapter one is mediated by very specific types of neurons that detect the temperature changes and then fire off these action potentials to provide the input signal we need to get that information to the appropriate control center. The other type of cell found in nervous tissue are called glial cells. Glial cells come in many different varieties that we will discuss in greater detail when we start talking about the nervous system in a few weeks. But the important thing to know for now is that glial cells do not fire electrical impulses. They are not anything like the neurons. What the glial cells are there to do is to take care of the neurons, to make sure that the neurons are healthy and happy and have everything that they need in order to function. So if we focus a little bit more on the neuron itself, and again, these will be things that we bring up again when we start talking about the nervous system, neurons have a number of different components to them, and that's kind of because neurons are very unique looking. One of the main features that a neuron has is attached to kind of the cell body where you find the nucleus is a very long process called an axon. The axon is not unlike a big electrical cable that makes a connection between the cell body of the neuron where any sensing was done and it forms a connection with wherever that message is supposed to go, whether, whether it's a muscle cell, a glandular cell, or something else. So this axon carries these action potentials away from its cell body and this electrical impulse is greatly sped up by the presence of this in this figure, this purple substance called a myelin sheath. Now it's not actually purple in real life, it's just colored here so you can see it better. So the myelin sheath is basically an insulating material that is provided by two different types of glial cells just to give examples of what glial cells tend to do. These glial cells are called oligodendrocytes if they are in the central nervous system and Schwann cells if they are in the peripheral nervous system. And we will have a much greater discussion on not only those, but other types of glial cells like astrocytes, ependymal cells, and microglia when we start talking about the nervous system in earnest. So what neurons are really going to allow us to do, as we've been mentioning, is it allows for long distance communication. And this is because those axons, those big cables that carry the action potential electrical impulses, they tend to be very, very long. Some neurons have axons that are up to a meter in length. That's well over half of the entire length of your body. So the idea here is that Generally speaking, the cell bodies of these neurons are going to be embedded somewhere in the brain or in the spinal cord. So if, say, the brain or the spinal cord wants to send a message to some far-off tissue or some far-off organ, like, say, the skeletal muscle in your leg, we talked about the patellar tendon reflex in a prior uh, discussion, 
or say we want to get a message to the heart to get it to beat faster to raise your blood pressure, you can see here how these messages might get from A to B. The action potential would start here in the brain or the spinal cord near the cell bodies of these neurons. The electrical signal would travel down the length of the neuron axon until it gets to the end of the axon from where the axon will release a certain type of chemical messenger called a neurotransmitter. And when this neurotransmitter reaches, say, the muscle fiber, it will contract. When the neurotransmitter reaches the heart tissue, the heart tissue will change its function appropriately, whether it's to increase or decrease blood pressure or perhaps do something else. So we will get into the importance of mechanisms like this when, again, we get to some of our later chapters on cell-to-cell -cell communication and the nervous system. But for now, just make sure that you appreciate that because neurons have these very, very long axons, it provides a way that we can send messages over very long distances in the body. And hopefully by now you appreciate, given our prior discussions on homeostasis, how important it is to get these lines of communication carried throughout the body. So that is going to do it for this very short video on nervous tissue. Go ahead and join us next time and we will start moving on to the next tissue on our agenda, which is muscle tissue. Bye-bye.